COVID is a very hot topic at the moment, and one of your most recent papers published in 2020 looked at the SARS-CoV-19 spike protein, um, which uses ACE2 to gain entry into the cell. And because this, I read as well that it was a highly mediated um, gene sequence. So that's kind of why we've seen COVID in like house cats and tigers. And like in the Netherlands, they killed so many mink to prevent a further spread. Um, can you talk to us about the conception of this paper and then also expand upon some of the findings that you've had? Yeah, yeah so we, we kind of, um, again, this was like in collaboration with um, my old supervisor, uh, Christina Ringo, uh, and Sudat Lam in, in Malaysia, so who um, did a PhD with Christine. And yeah, it was just the start of lockdown and we started to, you know, the, the genome sequence became available and we started to look through it and, and you know, um, look at the structures of the proteins. And we kind of, you know, a lot of things were shutting down. So we we kind of started to put our heads together and, you know, one of the, you know, we just started to throw some ideas around. And then one thing that became clear quite quickly, quite quickly was that, um, you know, there was some cases, I think it was um, a cat was identified initially as kind of, you know, had been infected um, with SARS-CoV-2. So I kind of, at that point, I, you know, I had a quick look at the sequences for a few different vertebrates. And you could see that it was very conserved across, you know, the, all, all vertebrates, for example. So we, one thing we can do in bioinformatics is we can predict the structures of, of proteins, you know, so we can, if, if you've got um, an existing crystal structure, you can do something called homology modeling, where you kind of, you, you, you fit in the, the, the protein sequence that you want to predict the structure for against the structure. Um, and so we, we kind of, you know, we put this idea together that maybe we could look across the tree of life, um, look across, you know, the vertebrate tree of life. And once we had the structures of the, 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 um, the complex of ACE2 and um, the spike protein predicted for all of these organisms, we could do a bit more bioinformatics where we, we predicted the energy of the binding. So we, we could sort of say, you know, how much more or less stable is the, is the interaction for say cats or, or ferrets or, you know, whatever organism compared to the human complex. Um, and so, you, you know, this was all happening in lockdown and we were just kind of like, you know, the team started to expand and there was more and more people getting involved, which is really nice because we, the idea was we wanted to get it done as quickly as possible, you know, try and get it you know, same time doing the right thing. So we, but we wanted to test, you know, what was the best approach because um, there's lots of different options that we could try out. So we, we tried out all those things. We kind of did an initial benchmark and then we found the method that worked the best that fitted with the empirical data. Um, and then, yeah, for the predictions, we could see that it was quite, you know, the, the, the spike protein is able to bind to, um, you know, a lot of different um, vertebrates and we kind of ranked different, organ different um, animals depending on how, susceptible they were to, you know, having a strong interface between the spike protein and the ACE2 receptor. And um, it's a surprisingly large amount of the tree of life, to be honest, when we saw that, we were a bit like, oh, this, this could be, you know, this could be interesting. But, you know, at the same time, you could see that um, it's just, just because the spike and the ACE2 bind doesn't mean that you actually necessarily get, you know, an infection and a, because there's lots of other proteins involved and each, each animal has its own um, sort of defenses. But yeah, that got taken up and it was used by um, like a few international agencies at the time. So I think some of the, the WHO used it and some of their you know, planning and a couple of other international organizations. And it was kind of used to sort of, um, you know, so if people were going to zoos, um, you know, I remember going to a zoo and seeing a, you know, a gelada baboon, uh, it was kind of the one near Bristol. And um, we were just kind of, and it was, just before lockdown and it was kind of like we could see the sequences were you know were very close so we we're just kind of like you know maybe these things should be you know there should be kind of more limited access you know and it was the case in, in i think the bronx zoo where a tiger got infected so and you know the one of the reasons is we not we were kind of quite conscious we didn't want to spread any panic um but we wanted to you know we just put that out there and um you know so people could kind of see the information um but yeah, yeah, so it's one of those things, you know, as much as the pandemic's been bad for humans, we don't want it to, you know, impact, you know, endangered wildlife. And we also don't want it to turn into kind of a zoo, you know, this kind of 
any reservoirs out there that could have harbor it for, you know, and then it could jump back to humans, for example. So, and then other groups kind of did what we did and then uh, using their own methods. So we got this out really early and then other groups did, this, you know, a similar approach or parallel approaches and we could see where our methods and their methods agreed. And, and that's how science works. It worked quite nicely, you know, it's like, a, and then over time, more and more actual experiments were done to show which organisms were susceptible. And um, yeah, generally our, our data, our predictions stood up quite well. Um, so we, mm. we were quite happy overall with, with that. Um, but yeah, bioinformatics it is to remember it is just a prediction. So it's kind of, again, you're revising, uh, you know, you kind of almost, you can do it very quickly because you can do it in a computer, but and that those predictions can inform what experiments you might want to, you know, you might want to say in this case, you know, let's check quickly if, you know, um, ferrets are susceptible or some other organisms susceptible because the predictions from the computer suggest that they are. So, yeah. What was some of the surprising prediction of certain vertebrae or, you know, maybe animals? What was like, what were you like, oh, this could be an interesting spreader or something which should be made more aware? I know it's a prediction. It wasn't concrete yeah. or anything, but, you know, from a prediction, something can be investigated. Yeah, um, there was quite a few strange ones. I mean, one thing that surprised me was when we looked at the horseshoe bats, for example, how um, a lot of them were predicted because horseshoe bats is like, you know, one of the, um, it's one of the horseshoe bat species is, is what we think um, was the potentially where SARS-CoV-2 mm. came from originally. But within that um, genus, there's a you know, huge diversity of, of species. Um, one of the things that I found interesting was that a lot of the bats showed very poor binding to the virus, um, which suggested to me at the time that maybe there was a, like a really strong evolutionary pressure within the bats. If, if these coronaviruses are endemic to bats, you know, mm. they kind of have to change their ACE2 sequences to kind of avoid being infected potentially. But there was a really clear kind of, they were kind of hyper variable in terms of their ACE2 sequences, and especially yeah. where they were binding. So again, that's kind of an observation that you could if you had time, you could start to think about taking forward. Mm. Um, but yeah, certainly it looks like, I mean, we're doing some work now seeing how far back we can take the binding and we again with Christine um, and it's surprising how, how, you know, how potentially the, 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 the spike protein, it doesn't take much to change and it can, you know, really bind to another species quite quickly. So, um, we're also looking at a different part of the protein now, like the N-terminal domain, um, as opposed to the, the, the receptor binding domain, which when we look at the structure, so again, going back to um, sort of work with catagen 3D, you know, when we look at the structure, we see like homologies to a human protein called galactin-3. Um, so this is something that's important in cancer in, in, in our own body. So it's one of our own proteins. We can see that the virus has like clear homology to this, to this protein or clear, you know, structural homology. And we know that that's a sugar binding protein. So we can start to think, you know, maybe this part of the virus protein is actually, you know, binding to, you know, uh, some kind of sugar. And we can, maybe that's a potential. We can start to think of, you know, drugging that, that binding pocket in the future, because what we're going to need going forward is kind of, um, you know, a few of the virus species, you know, a few virus uh, lineages are really a lot, are really prone to jumping to, to, to um, humans or other animals. So, and coronaviruses are one of those. So mm. probably be pre prepared for next time. You know, we need to have kind of drugs that kind of work well against a range of coronaviruses, um, you know, and obviously get the vaccines ready to go as well. But I think, mm. yeah, the, the research over the coming, again, 10, 20 years is going to be a lot of, preparation just to prevent this happening again yeah because as much as preparing a vaccine we saw especially recently with these new variants from whether it was south africa or even england was that obviously take preparing a vaccine takes time and we realized that the mu mutation rate is ridiculously high so maybe like you said preparing the these stocks of antiviral drugs is a good kind of stop and go kind of point like kind of just to give a bit of relief to them maybe i don't know how many vaccines we'll have to develop each year now against coronavirus but and hopefully there won't be too much of a mutation between like you said like the spike protein because obviously if there's too much of a confirmation or tertiary change in the structure then maybe not you know the antibodies which we've developed now with this current vaccine 
you know, maybe two or three years time, hopefully, well, I hope not, gosh, I don't want to jinx it now, but <laughs> it will still be useful and effective against future coronaviruses. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they're going to have to update the vaccines and mm. ultimately they're going to have to, pre- you know, prepare vaccines that could, you know, probably go in and start to understand the coronaviruses more generally and, and get, um, you know, sort of get kind of preliminary vaccines ready for, 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 for different um, parts of the, that fam- family of viruses. Um, but yeah, like you said, like the, the nice thing about drugs is if, if, you know, you can just, if they're approved, you can get them going straight away. And, um, mm. but yeah, this it's kind of, hopefully next time we'll be a lot more prepared. Um, you'd think so. And people will sort of invest now to save money in the future. Um, I think now they've definitely tested it on their own skin. So I think <laughs> the interest is there, I think for investment. Yeah, so. <laughs> so yeah. So, um, mm. But yeah, and um, you know, it's been interesting to see where the field of structural biology has kind of helped with the the virus um, sort of vaccine development. So again, um, you know, you don't usually see structural biology, you know, in, you know, in the papers and things. But um, I saw convergent evolution has been mentioned a few times, and uh, again, going back to the basic research and the importance of basic research and how that influences um, things is. Um, the McClellan lab develops this um, double proline mutation um, in the spike protein that kind of stabilizes it in one conformation, the conformation you want to target the vaccine. And mm. again, we were only able to do that. They were only able to do that because of the structural biology. That's um, so really nice work from that group um, in Texas, I think. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, well, it's looking promising, luckily. But I think you know, finally, we can we say we can say some good news. I think really good yeah. from the, in this aspect. Um, Priscilla, yeah. I'll hand. Yeah, sorry, to Do you want to say something? Yeah, I I just wanted to ask. Um, you mentioned about how it mutates so much, and I remember um, was when the vaccine was it was first starting to get researched and coming out. Um, People were thinking that it could, this coronavirus could become a bit like the flu, um, which you know comes about every year, kind of seasonal. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, like the the flu vaccine kind of changes every year with it to fight against it. Do you think mm-hmm. that that's something that could happen with COVID? You know, we we get a base vaccine and then sort of change it as the virus mutates. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not you know not to spread any panic or you know, but it's yeah, you know, we, live other, we live with other coronaviruses. Uh, so, so you know, a couple Absolutely. of the cold viruses are, are coronaviruses, and who knows how dangerous they were when they first you know jumped to humans. Um, so yeah, you know, once once we've got you know vaccines and you know the more people have been exposed to it, it kind of eventually becomes yeah another much less hopefully much less dangerous um, um, virus. Um, so going forward, yeah, it's I think personally, it looks more like it will become, you know, less of a problem, but endemic rather than we'll ever necessarily yeah. get rid of it. But that's kind of beyond my field. Really. But, um, <laughs> I think it generally it's looking quite positive, uh, you know, in terms of um, how things go. I mean, it does have a low mutation rate compared to something like influenza. And um, because it's such a big, va- big virus um, for an RNA virus, it has a lot of, um, you know, it has a proofreading um, things that checks that there aren't mutations. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, the mutation rate, it rate is lower. Um, one thing people are kind of thinking about is recombination, but hasn't been, it's only been very limited evidence for that so far. So but yeah, yeah, let's watch this yeah. space of research, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> the Again, I suppose, you know, just kind of plugging my conservation, like, uh, yeah. sort of side of things, you know, one thing is like to take a holistic picture and just to think, you know, how did it jump from you know, a wild animal to, to, yeah. to humans in the first place. And just think we have to sort of think about these forest areas where, you know, there's this massive diversity of, of life, but also viruses, you know, there's, there's thousands of, likely to be thousands of different coronaviruses out there. So we have to sort of probably think a little bit more about, you know, um, sort of common sense about, you know, not destroying the environment. And, you know. mm. It's kind of more of a um, preventative approach as well to avoid that cross-species um, inf- infection, like you said, yeah. Potentially, mm. it was from a wildlife market. They don't know that yet, but it's um, yeah, 
Yeah, this it's kind of a weird story. Some say it was the market. Some say it was the biochemical lab at Wuhan. It's just ah, oh, the the theories just go on. I, I think there was that fun. Yeah. There was actually like recently, I think, because World Health Organization sent out scientists to check the the lab thing to check if anything, and they found that it was it wasn't from the lab. That's what the evidence concluded. Mm. Um, so well, that's somewhat comforting no to hear. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say a bit of a relief to hear that uh, what is a single piece of advice um, you would give to aspiring bioinformatics researchers um, yeah so that's a good question like what's um, it's quite a difficult question but in terms of a single piece of advice from my own experience um, one thing I found was when I did um, my undergrad um, you know I kind of to be honest, it's like a lot of the kind of, you know, academic learning and, and you know, taking things on. I, I kind of really enjoyed um, bioinformatics in my MRes that I did. And I, I, I enjoyed the um, the applied side of it. So, again, I kind of, I think I struggled at the first bit, you know, seeing what's the, what's the point in some of these things I'm learning. And it's, it's only when I actually started to do projects. Um, so I went to work at a drugs company in, in Switzerland. The, the at York University, we did placements um, and went to a drugs company there. Um, it was called Serono Pharmaceuticals at the time. I had a really good um, supervisor there called Massimo De Francesco, and he, he introduced me to neural networks and, you know, explained what the drug company needed. They needed, you know, some uh, some predictions for a pipeline they were developing and a, and a neural network to, to be developed for that, so this machine learning type approach. And it, it, I think for me, that was the kind of point I got it. You know, I was kind of like, actually, yeah, this is, you know, I'm, a, I'm taking sort of my knowledge that I learned under my undergrad, you know, sometimes a bit reluctantly, and I'm kind of applying it for something that I can really see the clear benefit of, you know, and that thing was really enjoyable to sort of think of all the theoretical kind of, um, you know, what a protein looks like, you know, how it gets secreted from the cell, you know, what's, what's the process, and, and to take that, that biological knowledge and try and sort of use that in a, comp you know, make a prediction algorithm that make use of that knowledge, um, for this specific task of developing drugs. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And that, so that's my advice is to basically kind of sort of just do it, you know, just kind of, you know, it's, um, I think, you know, there's a lot of, one of the, you know, obviously the pandemic's been terrible, but one of the, one of the, you know, few good things has been um, just how much a lot of these conferences have opened up to online. So it used to be, you, know, you, could, you had to fly to, you know, um, the West Coast of America, and it costs a lot of money and a lot of time. And um, now they just make them, you know, most of them like free and online. You can join by Zoom. So, you know, I think it's, it's even better now to really kind of, you know, learn about a subject. Um, and, you know, in terms of, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of free courses. So, you know, like the Welcome um, Sanger Institute, uh, they basically... I saw, you know, I sent to um, some students who I was teaching, you know, they had a free course. Um, so they were interested in, in sort of, you know, learning about programming in R, which is a programming language. So I sent them a link to that and they can sign up for that and, and it goes through all the basics. So I think, yeah, there's, it's kind of like, if it does excite you and, and you think you could, you know, you're interested in giving it a go, you know, I'd almost sort of, you know, just find your area of interest and, start to plan that project, start to take all of that knowledge that is just sort of sitting in your head and accruing over time and actually kind of start to make use of it. I think that process is, is cathartic and it's also really motivating to think, you know, actually this is, this is really valuable knowledge that I'm accumulating and I can apply it to, to help, you know, something that I'm interested in. So we undergrads have just have to hang in there for a little bit and then we'll really eventually start to get a taste of what it really is like to work in the scientific world by use, like you said, like the application of the knowledge. I think that's something which we can't see at the moment. We're very much buried in our textbooks at the moment. We're very much, in, you know, understanding the theory, but by the sounds of it, you know, you go into Switzerland and then finally realizing how the whole picture comes together with the predictions and then at the actual development of the drugs. I think that's something which is, I think that's the true real, that's the real, definition of a science working in science i think yeah yeah definitely so if you, yeah, if you can sort of you know keep the faith and then yeah like i think i'd encourage people to early on think what they might want to go into you know that sort of research areas that, that really interest them but yeah it's definitely almost the most difficult 
point I think mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. as you recruit in the information and not really using it but it's you know as soon as you start to use it and it's a really creative process you know you start to you know Dave probably talk, talks about this in his talk you know how you can be in the lab and you can you know apply this thing and start to really explore mm-hmm. you know it's yeah it's um or in bioinformatics you know it becomes a bit more like an adventure you know you just start to think about oh, where could I go with this you know what what could I what questions could I ask and um and that's why I like bioinformatics is it's it's kind of freeing because it doesn't cost anything so mm-hmm. you can just do it you know most of the time for 90 percent of projects you can just do it on a on a you know there's something called google collab for example where you can you can open a, a web browser and start to do python programming which is which is there for free you know and you can you can really start to download these big data sets you know the human genome whatever you want to and you can start to um bring this information that you've you know it's hard hard for information that you've been um, <laughs> learning for years and, and apply yeah. it just a mouse click away yeah um i i did have a question that came to mind just now um um so much of bioinformatics is computer based well it is mostly computer based and and you talked a lot about uh coding and um the, the google uh <laughs> yeah. the google yeah um so I wanted to ask about what was the most common coding language that's used in bioinformatics? So if anyone wanted to go into it and they had no background, they could begin, you know? Yeah, so it used to be a language called Perl, but that's kind of fallen a little bit by the mm. wayside. And it's now, I'd say Python is probably the main language. Um, uh, and that's just a good, it's kind of a, you can, you kind of you know you can do everything with it it's it's amazing and one of the kind of the the sort of not secrets but kind of you know tricks to bioinformatics is that other people write your code for you in the in things called libraries so for example for science there's something called scipy uh, and you kind of you kind of just download that and add it to your python code and then you get to use loads of functions for free so you know lots of complex statistical functions and there's equivalent things for you know, numeric Python or machine learning. So a lot of it is actually, you spend less time trying to code up difficult things that, you know, to be honest, is, is best left to someone who's a specialist in that area. And it gives you more time to be, you know, do the creative kind of biological innovation steps where you can kind of, you know, take all these methods and just apply them. Um, the other language that's common is called R. So it's just a capital R, like um, okay. a pirate's favorite language or something like that. <laughs> um, and that's um, that's really commonly used um, for you know um, things like RNA um, expression analysis or single cell expression. So that's and it, you know R is kind of probably as common as Python. Um, and personally, I prefer Python, um, but you know a lot of people prefer R. So it's kind of a matter of choice, really. But e- learning either is a great a great thing. I mean, the other thing is like you know even if you gave bioinformatics a try and you didn't like it you get a lot of transferable skills from it because, you know, data science more generally, you know, there's a lot of um, growth in that area, just, just, you know, in terms of jobs over the next 10 years anyway, because there's so much, we're kind of living in the data age where, you know, they're collecting data on everything and if you need to process it and think scientifically in a way about it, logically about it. And, uh, so it's very transferable um, as well. I am... Um... I, I don't, I mean, I wouldn't do bioinformatics as a full-time thing, but I, there is an interest to it. And it is quite interesting as like um, something to just learn about. And I found recently that there are a lot of um, Instagram pages of like mm-hmm. PhD students or things like that. And what they'll do is they'll give you sort of like crash courses on those sorts of things. And they're really, really interesting to follow. Because they do, I mean, I saw a crash course. And the only reason I know what that capital R thing is is because it came up <laughs> yesterday and they'll give you like crash courses on like, these are the bits of information that might be helpful if you're in any science. Um, wow. And they explain things so brilliantly and they're a really, really good thing to have just as, um, just to really open up your avenues and really see that there are so, so many areas of science that you probably haven't even thought of that mm-hmm. correspond with things like bioinformatics. Yeah, well, I, did, yeah, I didn't know about that. See, I'm, I'm too old for, for all that. No, you, there's really... never too late to open up a YouTube channel, maybe. <laughs> no. You can start your own Insta- you know, your Instagram. TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> That's where all the information is these days. Yes, yeah. 
can become a social yeah, media yes. influencer, Dr. Lee's. Yeah. That's the other thing, you know, you didn't really mention, you know, so much out there for, um, you know, training yourself. You know, there's so many um, things like MOOCs as well, these online courses, you know, yeah. the, um, EDX and other things or, uh, and, you know, or YouTube and, and just, just generally it's, it's all out there. It's kind of, um, so once you've got that ability to sit down and, and sort of teach yourself, you can kind of point yourself in any direction if you've got the time. Um, yeah, yeah. Instagram, okay, I'm gonna to have to look at, at some. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, it's actually been really informative. Um, yeah. For Thanks. our final question, um, it's a bit more lighthearted, um, but if you could invite one dinner guest, be living um, with us now or, you know, passed on, um, who would it be? And why would you invite them? <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, I mean, I think I'd, if he was living, I'd probably choose someone like David Attenborough. So it's a bit of a clean, mm. I think a lot of people would choose him, but that's one of the yeah. reasons I got into science. <laughs> and that interest in biology, just watching yeah. his programs in the 80s, like mm. he got me interested. Um, yeah, uh, not living, I guess I'd have to say Charles Darwin, given the current sort of uh, interview, you know, because obviously he's... Um, he just, you know, so much of, of, of what we do now is just, you know, trace it goes back to him. Um, so, yeah, like, I guess Charles Darwin would be great to show, you know, just you, know, you could uh, like, talk to him about where it's all gone, you know, because I, I don't think he'd imagine, like, where he'd be at today. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, Charles Darwin would be a great nice. choice. <laughs> <laughs> Big names, but, yeah. So. Big names, fun dinner times and conversations. <laughs> Gosh, I couldn't imagine Charles Darwin listening to everything that's going on, let alone trying to explain what a computer is, let alone explaining even even potentially all about genetics. And I was because honestly, when um when we were scripting this, I thought you were maybe gonna mention um like Mendel, because you with your you know interest in bioinformatics and genetics, maybe that could but I think you know you really went to the forefather, I guess, of <laughs> as well, like evolution and yeah, and he, even in sort of like cancer, you know, mm. what we see now is just how important evolution is, is in cancer. So, it's, you know, it's really, you see how we really have to think more and more about cancer as an evolutionary process because you might pick a protein to target. But what happens with, you know, drug treatment or CAR T therapies is the cancer can evolve away from that. So there's, there's diversity within a tumor and the the tumors that kind of express a bit less of the protein that you're trying to target as a therapy, you know, they kind of go on and expand more and, and, and exactly in the Darwinian evolution process, you know, they kind of um, essentially take over even though when, when the susceptible cells have been killed by the therapy. So it's really exciting. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's something we didn't really talk about much, but uh, protein engineering. And again, mm. that's our ability to kind of, you know, develop, you know, specific so in the case of car t therapy it's quite exciting you, you sort of basically you know build a molecule that, that targets a specific protein that's expressed hopefully on the cancer but not on other cells and it just kills the cancer that's the ideal situation but Amazing. also just you know in terms of you know um enzymes that can dissolve plastics or um you know novel antibiotics you know there's so much i think that's going to be probably one of the biggest growth areas in the next 30 years is like just this kind of um, engineering, like, you know, engineering um, biological systems in terms of, um, you know, novel enzymes and novel treatments. Um, and again, computers play a big part in that because you, we need them to kind of um, help guide those, um, those predictions. What should we change? What shouldn't we? And computers are really good at um, helping us to, to, sh to trim down the search space of, of options. Mm, amazing. Well, thank you ever so much for coming on. And hope you yeah. enjoy having this conversation with us yeah yeah thanks for the opportunity to talk and yeah good luck with the rest of the series yeah I'll... okay well thank you so much for joining us today um we really hope everyone enjoyed today's episode um in the description we'll um put dr lee's recent paper if you'd like to have a read and um tuning next week because we'll be having the careers team um with a variety of questions have a great weekend bye thank you for listening take care thank you bye